outside gearing up on your coffee at the branch cafe come on in make your way in make your want make your way up all the way to the front if you can I encourage you it's like the splash down right here we're gonna go ahead and 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 pray pray into the service i've been gone for the last two weeks in brazil and i just want to say it's so good i'm so grateful for our live stream and youtube it's so good to be back home with the family of god Can you guys say amen so let's just go ahead and open up our hearts we're gonna jump in to worship lord jesus Lord, we are so excited god what you have in store for your people today lord so right now lord we put our focus on you we want to give you our full attention Lord Jesus, Lord, we, we want to jump in, Lord, again, with both feet today to everything you have in store for us. Lord, so Lord, so, so Jesus, right now, we, we put away every distraction, every weight that we're carrying. We lay it down. We look directly into your eyes. We say, have your way in our hearts today. Have your way in the service. Lord, we are truly accepted in the beloved, accepted in the house of the Lord. And all God's people would shout, Amen. God bless you guys. Come on, put your hands together with us.
Can we give him high praise this morning? We lift your name. Come on, are you happy to be in church this morning? Are you excited that we serve a risen king this morning who brings life? Hey, we got a new song for you. We want to teach you this morning. We're gearing up for Easter. Anybody excited about Easter coming up? Yes. Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? Or is it going to be on the screen? Here we go.
church, let's lift it up with one voice, my soul.
voice to sing.
hands and all the come on, sing it on it. Singing like you've never sung it before to him. He's worthy. We give you praise and all of the honor. You are our God, the one we live for. We give you praise, all of the glory, God. Come on, we give you praise. We give you praise and all of the honor. You are God, the one.
to cover from head to foot, Lord, to cover every person in this room. You built us together as your living stones, as a spiritual habitation for you, for yourself, and right here in our midst, you, God, if you are here, Lord, if you want to touch, you want to transform, you want to change, you want to bring us into your love, you want to lose your healing and your life in and through every joint. God, and in this connection point right now, in this anointing of unity and praise, Lord, we lose your presence. Here's what we're going to do. Man, this is a holy moment. Do you guys feel good? Man, the Lord is here, and we're just going to reach out and just touch him just a little bit longer. We're going we're gonna to go back to this song. Are you ready for it? Church today. It's 
so good to be in the house, the Lord. We're going to go ahead and release our elementary age uh, children. They're going to go to see Miss Savannah and the team over there for New Life Kids. Also, let's just take a friendship break. High five a few friends close to you. Love on them. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to New Life. Happy Sunday. Say happy Sunday to the person next to you. I've been uh, gone for the last two weeks in Brazil, and it's just, and I love our live stream and YouTube, and, but there's nothing like being in the house of the Lord. Amen. So good to be here. Um, I'm, again, I'm Pastor John. If, if you're a guest with us for the first time, if you could do us a favor and fill out this uh, connection card that's on the seat back in front of you, then you can go ahead and drop it in the offering basket. That'll come around towards the end of the service, and that'll help us connect with you and better serve you. Also, we have a New Life gift bag with some goodies in there. Uh, you don't want to miss out on that. So if somehow we missed you on the way in, make sure you see our host team and grab one of those New Life gift bags on your way out. But let's, let's give Pastor Caleb a, a solid New Life greeting as he comes to bring the word this morning. Wow, so good to be together today. God is good. He's with us. Thank you so much for leading this worship team. That was awesome. John, great to have you back home, man. So good to have you home. John and Katya were down in Brazil, where Katya is from, and uh, visiting her family. So really good to have them home. Well, this morning, I want to just uh, take a moment and Tell, tell you something special that's going to be happening this Easter. Um, this Easter, to make room to, for, for more people to hear the gospel and be a part of our Easter services, we have a special announcement to make. Instead of doing two services, we're going to do three services on Easter Sunday morning. We're really, really excited about that. It's going to be 8, 9.30, and 11.15. And um, it's just going to be an awesome time together in the Lord. And we want to encourage you to, to be thinking about that and praying into that, inviting guests to that. We'll be sharing some opportunities to serve in that regard in the weeks, uh, in the next, probably next week or so, but um, just really looking forward to that. If uh, you didn't get one of these handouts coming in, you should be able to find one, and maybe our, our host team can, can uh, grab some of these and be walking around with them. You can lift your hand as they come through the aisles, but it's uh, our handout for part three today, and we're in our current series, Born Identity. If you missed weeks one and two, I really encourage you to go to newlife.com or go to our YouTube channel, New Life Novato. If you're watching online today, by the way, welcome. Good to have you with us on our YouTube channel. And uh, you can catch up on this series online on our, our YouTube channel. And it's been such rich teaching the first couple of weeks. I know I personally have gotten a lot out of it. You know, when you're teaching up here, you're not just giving people, you're not, we're not just preaching the word, we're actually being enriched by it as well. And so I just encourage you to uh, take a look at that. And today for part three, I want to speak to you about labels, specifically the power of correct and incorrect labeling. And I just wonder, you know, what kind of labels are you wearing? What does your name tag say? Maybe you can just throw that picture up there for me. What has stuck with you and shaped you? Those are labels. Labels are important. I, you know, think about what would happen if, if a prescription bottle didn't have a label on it. Or it had the wrong dosage on it. That could be really, really a, a huge problem. It could be even fatal. We have labels all around us. There's all kinds of them. There's record labels. There's clothing labels. There's food labels. All of them have to do with branding or, you know, with identifying the product in some way. And then you have additional labels that you might see in a product, you know, something that's fragile or handled with care, and specifically warning labels. And I thought I would share a couple of funny uh, warning labels with you this morning. Came across a few of these. A clothes iron had this advice, warning, never iron clothes while they are being worn. 
What's funny is that they had to actually say this because somebody had tempted it. Here's one on a Superman costume. Warning, cape does not enable user to fly. <laughs> on a portable stroller, caution, remove infant before folding for storage. <laughs> and this one's the best. In a microwave oven manual, do not use for drying pets. Isn't that awful? Can you imagine? Poor little puppy. Now, sometimes people don't want things labeled. You know, there's a huge fight today over this in the food industry. We're all pretty aware of the, you know, the movement to have GMO food, genetically modified you know, food, be labeled as such. And then there's a lot of groups that don't want people to know that and have it labeled like that because it could affect the bottom line. So there's people that don't want labels to be on things. And so there's all kinds of different stuff we could talk about with labels. But you know, labels aren't just about products or food or medication. They're about identifying people as well. And I don't know, first of all, if you've ever... I'm wondering if any of you have ever been mistaken for someone else. Anybody ever been mistaken for another person? Like somebody came up to you and like, are you so-and-so? And you're like, no, I'm not. And you feel bad for that person because it's, so, it's pretty embarrassing to get that wrong. Well, I, I've got to tell you, I've actually gotten Tony Stark more than once. <laughs> Click. No? There. Yeah. All right. I've gotten Tony Stark more than once. All right? And I don't think I really look like Robert Downey Jr. much, but... You be the judge. I don't know. Um, but I, seriously, you know, um, if you've mistaken someone for somebody else, you know, man, that can just be so embarrassing. I could tell you stories where I've done that. But we're talking about something more than just mistaking someone's identity. Sometimes it's not the case of a, mis of a mistaken identity. That doesn't really do anything to us or impact us. But what does impact us is a wrong label. What do I mean by that? Well, when people label you, they assume they know who you are, and they assume that they get you. And they really don't get you, and then they treat you based on their own assumption, and they've made up their mind about you, and really, the only way to feel in that situation is just judged. Somebody has, has categorically, they've, they've, they've for what is some past experience, they projected something onto you, and now you just labeled in that way. So today we're talking about the power of correct and incorrect labeling. And why is that important to us? It's important for this reason. You will, you will mistreat, excuse me, what you misdiagnose. You will mistreat what you misdiagnosed. If you don't truly see who someone is, you won't treat them in the right way. And inversely, or conversely, in the same way, you will rightly value what you properly recognize. You see who someone is. You see them as the beloved of the Lord. You see the image of God. And you're going to treat them with honor and respect. You're, sometimes God calls us to see stuff in people they can't even see in themselves. And to communicate the value and love of God to them. Both of these sides, both sides of this are true. So, as we're talking about labels Again, we're talking about the things that, that stick with us, that stay with us, for good or bad. Labels can become a part of our identity. And um, this deals in the positive sense of with what God says about you. And it can also be what we say about him. Remember when Jesus talked to the disciples and said, who do men say that I am? Then he said, who do you say that I am? And Peter got that one right. It's like, ding, 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 good job. Okay. We'll talk about that maybe next week a little bit, but there's different ways that labels, different directions they go, I guess I'm trying to say. This week, we're going to primarily focus on the labels given to us, given to you, and what to do with them, including the ones that, that the things that God says about you. And next week, we're going to focus on the labels that we give God, ourselves, and others. And so it's going to be sort of a two-week on this subject of labels. To segue into today's message, I want to go ahead and show you a video that will introduce us and get us thinking a little bit more about what God says about us.
pray with me. Father, we want to take very seriously what you have said about us. And I pray today that the power of your spoken word, the same spoken with the same voice that spoke in the worlds were formed, we would understand in a deep way the power of your word to speak deeply into our lives to shape us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. In an English school, a computer mistakenly labeled bright children as intellectually challenged and challenged children as bright. And the teachers began to treat the students based on that label. They treated them accordingly. And when they found that when the bright children were treated as challenged, their IQs actually declined, while when the challenged children were treated as bright, their IQs went up. And that shows us something really interesting. It shows us how labels can be both powerfully destructive and powerfully constructive. And it brings us to the first point of the message. It's a little bit split up on the front cover between the front and the back. But the first point this morning is that labels create expectations. It's on the inside cover. Labels create expectations. That includes expectations that I have for myself, expectations others have of me. Labels can set a direction, create a mindset, form a standard, and now certain behaviors become expected or not expected based on that title, based on that label that was given to me or assigned to me. And in a lot of ways, a label can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, I'm not meaning to say that everything we say is, is prophetic in the sense of like a gift of prophecy. I don't mean it like that. But I'm referring to what Proverbs 18.21 says when it, sa- when, it, when it says this, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Think about that for a minute. Death and life. Our words can be life-giving words or life-draining words. That includes labels that we would have about ourselves. They can be life-giving or they can be life-draining. And so we look at another, another way at James chapter 3, verse 6, gives us another, another important truth about our words, including labels. It's, the scripture says there, the tongue sets on fire the course of nature. Our words set a course. The Greek word there for course, when you look at it, it has to do with a wheel. In other words, our words get the wheels turning. It sets something in motion. It, it causes something to run its course. When a, when a word is spoken, when something is, is released in language, it starts something. And specifically, when you look at what course here, it's talking about the course of nature. And that word is a word we talked about a little earlier in this series. It's the word Genesis, which has to do with our nativity, with our birth, what we were born with. We're starting to talk here about words that set on fire the course of our very identity, the course of our nature. Words create worlds. God spoke and the worlds, plural, were formed. Think about that for a second. Okay. (laughs) But did you know that we created in God's image? We speak and our words create the world around us, shape the world around us, shape our environment. Our self-talk shapes our insides, our spiritual formation in a lot of ways. When we speak, it affects the environment all around us and within us. And assigning a label to something carries a particular weight because labels are full of meaning. A name is particular defining. It, it, it shapes us. And I want to give an example of this. A phrase that I've heard over the years, and maybe you've heard it too, is uh, people saying this about themselves. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Now, I know Paul called himself the chief of sinner. I, I know we can find chapter and verse for why that you know, they would say, hey, it's okay to say that, okay? And I know that we're saved by grace too. Don't, don't get me wrong. But I'm going to tell you something about that verse right there. That, that verse is assigning an incorrect identity to you. I mean, it's not a verse, sorry. <laughs> that saying is assigning an incorrect identity to you, and you cannot find a verse to back it up. 
not directly. Let me show you a verse in Romans 1.7. Paul writes to them, before he's ever even been there, by the way, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Now, called to be saints sounds like a goal, and it is a goal, but it's, it, the way it's phrased there makes it sound like some kind of unattainable standard, and the translators actually inserted the words to be in italics to make the sentence flow a little bit better when they're translating it, but in the original Greek language, the word to be is not there, and it's not a future thing that that verse is communicating in the original language. What it's simply saying is, beloved of God, called saints. Now! Ahora, right in this moment, saints, holy ones. So, in other words, you're not a sinner saved by grace. You were a sinner. That's a label that's on the old nature. In Christ, you are a saint. You're a saint saved by grace. Yes, you're a work in progress. We just saw that in the video. Yes, we're growing in maturity. Yes, we stumble. We need forgiveness, those kinds of things. But here's the deal. You have a new DNA. Sin is no longer your identity. The old nature is no longer on your name tag. It's not your identity anymore. Jesus is your identity. And now, sin is the exception, not the rule. Jesus is Lord. It's not normal for you to sin anymore as a, as a follower of Christ. It's an abnormality It's a, because you are a new creation. There's a provision for it, yes, but it's an abnormality. It's not who you are. You're called a saint. You're called new creation. You're called son, daughter. You're called the one that gives, brings me great joy. Now, the word saint carries different expectations. We talked about how labels create expectations. The word saint brings new expectations. When you know that you're called saint, when you're tempted and you're facing something, you know that Jesus has provided for you and he has opened up a door of victory for you. You're not facing that temptation going like, I'm about to fail. If you're wearing the sinner label and something comes to you like, here it goes. You expect to not succeed. When you are understanding who you are as the Lord, you are expecting Victory. Come on and say amen. amen. All right, let's look at the second point across the page there. You've been called by a new name. You are not who you were. You've been called by a new name. You are not who you were. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. I'm going to read this. This is an example of, for me, many of the scriptures that we see in the Bible that talk to us about who we are in Christ right now. And I encourage you to look at the scripture with a certain lens as you're going through and looking at who we are in Christ, just almost to like underline verses, words like now, words like you are, <laughs> words that are talking to us about this, this new identity. I want to explain something. When you were, when I was born again, when you were born again, it's like there was a new birth certificate given to you. <laughs> You know when a baby's born, we just saw little, little uh, Clayton Balthazar born, the pastors of our New Life Santa Rosa Church had a baby, so cute. And like we went and we held him and we're like, we, we could do this again, right? Like this is, you know, you kind of you have these moments and you just, you just kind of do this thing. But there's a, little, there's a birth certificate when a baby's born, your height, your weight, who your parents are, and you know, the city you were born in, some of the statistical information that gives the basics about your birth. I want to tell you that when you are born again, there is a supernatural, eternal kingdom birth certificate that is attached to your life with your new identity, and it has some of the things like we see in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 on it, and some things that are unique just for you because you are fearfully and wonderfully made, and there's no one else on the planet like you. So I just think that we need to understand, like, the power of what happened when we, were, when, when we were born again. Sometimes we're so, like, we're more afraid of our difficult side or, or someone else's difficult side. We're more, like, in fear of that than we, are in un, than we are, like, in a place of unabashed admiration for their new nature. Like, wow, this is amazing. Look what God has done. That needs to be the stronger thing that we have because we really are seeing. Can you say Amen. All right, look what it says in 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are, everyone say it, you are. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, 
that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. We go back to verse 9 there, and we see that we're a chosen generation, first of all. You are that. He chose you. We didn't even initially choose him. He chose you first. You are a royal priesthood. And by very definition, to be royal means to be related. It means to be a son or daughter. You have royal blood in you. You're family. and, And you have the privilege, not just the responsibility, but the privilege of being a part of what the family does. Access, ministry, a holy nation, saints, not sinners. All of these things that we see there. So powerful to think about that. It says, in the past, go to verse 10 there on the screen, please, thank you. It says, who once were, but are now. There's this huge difference that we see there between the past and the present. Once were versus right now. I love the story in Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah was shown a vision of the high priest in Israel at the time. His name was Joshua. And Joshua was standing before the Lord in filthy garments. And the, and the Bible says that the devil was there accusing him. Railing accusations at him. And God changes his clothing, gives him totally clean garments, which is a picture of righteousness, our righteousness in Christ. And the angel says, the Lord rebuke you. And the Lord deals with the accuser. But part of the garments that are put on Zechariah, he's a crown. A hat is put on his head with an inscription that says, Holiness to the Lord. Did you feel that when he saw on the screen where it says, You're now called holy, pure, blameless in Christ? It's amazing. It's our inheritance. It's who we are in him. This verse highlights that. But I want to also kind of highlight the way the enemy works. You know, the enemy's accusations are simply him assigning you a name that doesn't belong to you. It's not on the original birth certificate. It never should be. It never was. It's not who you are. But he wants you to wear it. He wants you to wear it like a boss. He wants it to become the identity that defines all that you are. And so you go around thinking, acting, behaving according to that label. He comes and says, has God said? The first thing the enemy says in the Bible, has God said? Did God really say that? Do you think God really meant kind of like more like this? Every funky conversation you ever have about some biblical truth, and it starts feeling funky, that's in it. Does God really really mean that? Fill in the blank. Spin, spin, spin. Listen, redemption restores me to my right name. And redemption restores my right name to me. It goes both ways. It restores I want to read to you from Isaiah 62 some really, really important verses that I, I believe are, are going to speak to your heart. Show you an example of this. It's Israel, but it's a lesson for us too. I want to look at it as Isaiah 62 verse 2. It says here, The Gentiles shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. Or all, and all kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord will name. Let me camp there for a second and just tell you what the word called means. In the Hebrew, it's kara, and it's the word that when God created the universe and he created the earth, he saw the, when when, when he saw the light, he called it day. When he saw the dry land, God called it earth. And he began to describe it, and he began to label it. And when, he see, and, and when God spoke in the beginning, his words had creative power. That same one, when he calls you by a new name, is assigning an identity to you. And when he does that, and he calls you a new cre- uh, creature, there's creative power released to actually transform our nature into the thing he said. That's what this is talking about when he called you by a new name. And now, I'm a nickname guy. I really am. And my kids know this. They each have like 15 nicknames or at least. Most of my friends around me, I've abbreviated, nicknamed in a couple of ways. My staff all have nicknames. You you talk to me for about five minutes. I might give you a nickname too. 
that's a neutral thing. That's just relational. That's just fun. When God calls us something, it releases creative power in our lives. Now check out verse 4. He said, you shall no longer, can you all say no longer? You shall no longer be termed forsaken, nor shall your land anymore be termed desolate. But you shall be called Hephzibah and your land Beulah, for the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. You know, years ago, the Lord began to speak to us about Marin County, and he said, begin to speak over Marin when I'm speaking over Marin. Don't call it all the stuff that other people call it. Speak life. All right. But this is speaking also just of us, primarily of us. This word termed is, is fascinating to me because it, it means it's a little different than called. To be termed, it means to say or have a name assigned. And it also means to say in our heart, to say in one's heart. And what we learn by this is like sometimes labels aren't what others have called us, but things we even say and repeat about ourselves. It may come out of our mouth. It may just be a thought process. But it's a mindset. It's self-talk. And it says, no longer will you, be ter- will you be termed forsaken. I feel like that's for somebody here today. You're no longer termed forsaken. Don't think it. Don't say it. Don't believe it. Forsaken means abandoned, left behind, deserted, left alone. You've not been left alone. Jesus says, I'm with you. I've always been with you, and I'll never leave you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. That's a label that was on Israel, and God is saying, I'm canceling it. I'm striking it out. I'm removing it from the record. It's not who you are. And in a second, we're gonna, we, and then we see what else he, he said about them there. Desolate. No longer termed desolate. Desolate means unfruitful or a, a wasteland or simply just a waste. I feel like some of us look at our lives and we see wasted time or the situations that didn't go right and we start to think to ourselves, what a waste or even I'm a waste or loser or anything like that. And it's, it's not who you are. And it's a label the enemy's trying to attach to you. I'm telling you this morning, God says no more. And he says, never again. God has and is canceling that. Maybe disappointment was a label over you. Not measuring up or whatever it is. He has and is canceling that. I don't care if it's tattooed on you. It can be tattooed on you. You're like, well, it's just there. Hey, I, I love Chris Polito's story. I don't know if he's here this morning in the house, but he's a man, a young man of God in our house that he used to have gang tattoos all over him. He went through the painful process of having those things removed. And what's even even greater about his story is that this dude is such a powerful, prophetic guy. His whole identity has been transformed in the kingdom of God. And here's what I'm here to tell you. Even if the identity was tattooed on you in some way, tattooed on your heart, heaven has its own tattoo removal system, has its own lasers to come and burn that thing out of your heart and brand you with love and mark you with identity and mark you with the goodness and the faithfulness of your father. And I, I want to say this probably in another message, but it is amazing when you think about labels. The Bible says, God says, I've written you on the palm of my hand. You want to talk about being labeled? God himself is carrying you in the palm of his hand. Wow. Amazing. So what labels have been given to you that weren't from God? God's saying never again. What label have you given yourself? Maybe it was unwanted or unworthy or alone or whatever it is. God's saying no more. What lies have you learned that need to be broken off of your life? Sometimes lies are told to us, and other times we accept. When we accept those things, we now have learned them, and it is affecting how we think, how we speak, how we live, how we behave even. And that's why I'm so grateful for what the Bible calls the renewing of our mind. Because as disciples, we're learning in Christ, but we're also unlearning. There's a learning curve and an unlearning curve. <laughs> some of us need to get on the unlearning curve for some of the, all of us actually do in some way, to unlearn these labels, to unlearn these, these uh, things that were not supposed to be attached to us. Look what verse 12 says in Isaiah 62. 
and they shall call them the holy people. What's happening is there's such an identity change that now everybody else that sees them is saying, wow, (laughs) they're the holy people. (laughs) They're the redeemed of the Lord. You shall be called sought out, a city not forsaken. God is the one. He changes. We've been called by a new name. You're not who you were. Let's go on to point three the back side of your handout. This point is that we must each choose to embrace and live in our new names. Yes, God has spoken a new name and canceled the old, but we have to choose to embrace, to align with that new name, that new identity, and live in that place. Amen? It's, it's really important that we, we choose to do that. We choose to align in that way in our lives. I want to share a few highlights from Rachel's message last week and, and amplify those a bit. I just was, do you ever hear something new in the Word and you're like, oh, that's so good. I just felt like I was just getting blown away by a passage I've read many, many times last week. And I want to just take a moment to reread three verses in Acts 28 about Paul's story without retelling the whole thing too much. It says in Acts 28 verse 3, when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, A viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. Now just remember what was happening here uh, briefly. 14 days in a storm. They don't know where they are. Now they're they're shipwrecked. They come to an island. They're freezing cold. They They hardly have anything to eat. And now it's like, thank you, Lord, fire. You know how good a fire feels, man, when you've been out skiing all day or something like that? These guys have been in the storm for two weeks. Hands out over the fire, and then all of a sudden, a viper fastens onto his hand. Like my sound effects? (laughs) Now, the scripture says in the next verse, it's hanging there. It's not just, it's, so now Paul is there, warming hands by the fire. Now the viper comes out, is fastened onto his hand. Verse 4, so when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand. They said to one another, this was more than one conversation. All of them began to buzz about this. They said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer whom though he escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow him to live. Verse 5, but he, Paul, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. Everyone say no harm. harm. Now, just to to recap a little bit, the Malta Islander saw the viper bite, and they saw the viper bite Paul, and they had this karma-based thinking, and they, they made, they assigned a label to him in that moment based on that kind of thinking, and they said, this guy is, right now, he's a murderer. They accused him of being something that he actually was before he was, before he came to Christ, because he killed Christians. He killed followers of that way, and persecuted them. Now, Paul could have sat there on the one hand and said, you know what? I deserve this. But he also knew that he was totally forgiven in Christ and he was a new creation. In fact, he's the one that penned. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. And we learned last week we can't lose our head. We can't let the viper's poison get into our thinking and begin to confuse what is with what was. Two very different things. Scripture says in 1 Corinthians 6.11, such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. Were and was are completely different from are and is. (laughs) Tenses matter. Verb conjugations matter. I'm not just getting semantical with you here. I'm letting you know there's a big difference between your past before Christ and the reality now as a new creation. And they said to him in this, in this situation where he's already a new creation, they witness all of this. They look at the circumstance. They look at Paul. They look at the snake. And they all begin to say, no doubt, emphatically, this man is right now a murderer. Present tense. It's a very strong label. But based on the cross, God saw Paul and he said, this man was a murderer. 
But he is my son. He is a new creation. And he is an apostle on his way to Rome doing something I've called him to do, which is why everybody on this ship is still alive after all. Paul's, God told him, said, hey, you got to be in Rome. I'm going to give you and everybody on the ship. They're all going to be alive and make it because of you. That's a big, that's a really, I mean, God had already spoken that to him in the last chapter, but that's a really big, he had to stay anchored in that perspective. He's a new creation. Now, here's what I'm saying all that to say this, okay? In that moment, Paul had a choice. Would he step outside of his new identity in Christ? When they said you're a murderer, would he go back and put that murderer label back on and say, you're right, I, I, I'm a murderer. Throw that slide up there if you would. I'm a murderer. Put on the murderer name badge. The identity of his old sin nature. Would he respond to that label by regressing back into an old mindset, an old identity? Or would he stand in the truth of who he is now in Christ? Would he wear the new creation label? And, well, not, not put it on, but keep it on. You know, each and every one of us have this choice in the big moments and the small everyday decisions. When I face something, when I face a situation, when I face an attack of some kind, my identity being questioned in, 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 from, in a spiritual attack of some sort, am I going to stand in my identity in Christ as a new creation, or am I going to regress back into this old thing? And Paul made a, made a decision, I'm, I'm never going back. I'm never turning back. I've decided to follow Jesus. I am in Christ, and he shook that thing off into the, into the fire. I began to think about, you know, um, the Lion of Judah shaking his mane. <sighs> You ever see like, you know, the Chronicles of Narnia when Aslan shakes his mane? I mean, I, I begin to get the, you know what, it, you're, you're, you take, you're in his likeness and image. It's like, it's time to, you're, you might be little Simba still, but you have the nature of the king in you. You might not be Mufasa, but you're Simba. You're a son, you're a daughter. Mufasa. <laughs> it's time for us to shake it off. Come on and say Amen. I just went all Lion King on you. That was, you know, a rabbit trail, a lion trail. Okay. The thing is the the viper's poison will influence your thought process. It always had, and that's what happened in the garden. Has God said, the enemy is always there to come and say, the cross isn't valid in your case. If God loved you. This wouldn't be happening to you. You don't deserve God's love. He came to Adam and Eve and said, God's trying to hold something back from you. You should go and eat this. Has God said, has God said. That's his M-O. Shake it off. Shake it off. Shake it off. Shake it off. Shake off the old labels. The royal nature is inside of you. It's time to shake it off. And there's just so much we could get into with that. But we're going to bring this to a close today and come to the Lord's table. And as we do that, and I'm going to invite the worship team to come the words that really stand out to me in some of the scriptures we read today is no more termed. No more. No more. That really stands out to me. What really stands out to me is the viper did him no harm. That means there was no evil effect of that viper's bite. It could not influence his physical body. And I feel like the Lord's given us a word in that, that the labels and the mud and the things that that are slung our way in our spiritual walk as we're on this journey, God is saying, there's a way to stand in me that those things cannot harm you, influence you, or affect you. Because you're standing strong in Christ. And I believe today God has something powerful for us at this table, this communion table. And we're going to come to that in just a moment. We have a, something special we're going to do around that. But before we do, I just want to ask us all to... Let's start with this. Put your hand on your heart today and pray for us all and just seal this word. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for everything you've done for us. We stand before you, Lord. We are so thankful. We are so grateful. And this morning, this morning, Brothers and sisters, wherever there's been a label attached to you in some way that is not on your kingdom birth certificate. In Jesus' name, Lord, over every heart, we command those labels canceled. 
Every assignment of the enemy we declare canceled. Every assigned label. And Father, I pray today that every heart would be marked afresh with your love, with your goodness, with your faithfulness. A new creation. Daughter, son, never alone. Loved, valued, accepted. And while we're praying here for a moment, I also want to just ask everybody here to search your heart for a minute. We talked about being in Christ, that anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. It all begins, it all begins by saying yes to Jesus, yes to His invitation by confessing Him as Lord, by responding to His invitation for salvation. And if you're here today and you'd say, Caleb, I'd like to begin a personal relationship with God this morning. I want to pray to receive Christ today. Put my faith and trust in Him. Right now, I'd like you to do something bold. I'd like you to lift up your hand and say, remember me in prayer. I want to receive Jesus today as my Lord and Savior. Slip it up boldly. Slip it up confidently today. Say, that's me. I see you, sister, right there in the middle. Awesome. Anybody else? Say, hey, that's me. I want to receive Jesus today, right now. It's my Lord and Savior. Looking around, waiting for a moment. Would you guys search your hearts and let the Lord work inside of you? Anybody else? All right, you can put your hand down. We're going to say a very simple prayer for you that raised your hand and anybody else that maybe you wanted to but didn't, I want you to pray this prayer this morning as well. You're online watching. Pray it with us where you are in your home or watching wherever you are right now. Congregation would join me. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love. Thank you for dying for me on the cross and rising again the third day. I receive your forgiveness and I confess you as Lord. Be my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You that lifted your hand, we want to pray with you personally in a few minutes. So please, we're going to ask you to come and just pray with someone from our team. But right now, we have a very special treat. I'm going to ask Dr. Ken Searle, who is on staff here at our church, uh, serving in many different ways in the past and currently is teaching in a number of different Bible colleges, universities, to come and bring a word related to the Lord's table today and bring us to, the, bring us to that time of communion together. Can you give him a big warm welcome this morning? get my eyes on. Speaking of communion, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 26 states, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In other words, in a moment you will be preaching. So I want to tell you what it is you'll be preaching. Another term used for the death of Christ is atonement. And Pastor Caleb has asked me to share from Romans chapter 8 today to prepare us to take communion. Romans 8 lists many benefits of Christ's atonement. Romans 8 begins with no condemnation and ends with no separation. Romans 8 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 38 through 39, the Apostle Paul said, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In between no condemnation and no separation are several identity markers 
or what Pastor Caleb has been rightly calling today labels. And in addition to these identity markers are marvelous promises such as, and I have 12 points and I'm going to blast right through them because this is what you're going to be proclaiming as you take the body and the blood of the Lord. One, we are people ruled no longer uh, by the flesh, but now you can be ruled by the Holy Spirit. That's chapter 8, verses 2 through 10. Two, because the spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, that same spirit will give life to your mortal bodies. That promise is seen by many as, as a promise of divine health. That's chapter 8, verse 11. Three, God has taken away the spirit of slavery and given you the spirit of adoption, whereby you no longer address God as master, but now as dad, father, pops, because he has truly made you his child. Romans 8, 15 and 16. Four, the suffering you experience in life now has eternal meaning that will end in glory for you. Because life is going to happen to you. Five, the Spirit of God whom you have now received promises to pray through you and for you in the will of God with groanings too deep for words. Romans 8, 26 and 27. You ever have those moments where life hits you really hard? You get alone with God. Maybe you start crying and you don't even know what to say. You just start to moan. Well, right here, this text says God takes those moanings and groanings in the Holy Spirit and transfers them into a perfect prayer for you in the will of God. Six, God causes everything that comes your way in life to work for your advantage. Almost everybody knows this verse, Romans 8, 28. For God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God are called and crew his per He doesn't say all things that happen to you are good. Some are really ungood. It's like the back of a tapestry. If you've ever seen the big tap tapestry hanging, because it's all gnarly and ugly on the back, you flip that thing around, what do you have? Beauty. And that's the promise of God for you. Romans 8, 28. The next verse, seventh point, God is making you look more like Jesus every day, and you will continue to do so until he succeeds. Eight. You are now the called, justified, and glorified. You're actually the predestined, the called, the justified, and the glorified. Pastor Caleb said uh, Greek verbs matter and they do. Th these are actually in the aorist. The aorist is really not a past, present, or a future. It's more of a reality tense in Greek, which means you really were called. You really are justified, and you really are glorified. In other words, it's a done deal. Romans 8.30. God is now for you. Who can be against you? It says, Romans 8.31. At this point in the first service, and I'll do it again, I got permission. One of my students this morning texted me. So I texted her back, said, can I tell your story? I'll change your name. She said, you can use my story. So we'll call her Karen. And uh, she was about 18 or 19 years old when this happened. Um, she was alone, really had no Christian background. She was just trying to survive. And she was working as a prostitute. And she said, the man that was handling me showed up in a you know, brand new white Range Rover. I got into this beautiful leather vehicle. I got out of my dingy, rotten Oakland apartment. And she said, I was sitting in the back seat driving to serve a client. And I, I just looked up and I said, God, again, no Christian background. She said, I just looked and said, God, is this who I am? Is this all I'm worthy of? Is this really my life? And she said, Jesus spoke to me. And he said, no. This is not what you're worthy of. You're worthy of me. This is not who you are. And uh, God did it. Now she's one of my Bible college students, loves Jesus, sings on the streets in Oakland, and shares her testimony. <laughs> we serve a real God. Ten, and because he did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Romans 8.32, that means God is truly your provider. He will withhold nothing good from you from now on. 11, no one can bring a charge against you because God will defend you. Romans 8.33 and 34, and finally 12 to the end, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ, 8.35, and the love of God in God, Romans 8.35 through 39. All these benefits were accomplished by Jesus on the cross, from no condemnation to no separation and everything in between. So as you take communion today, remember, through his broken body and shed blood, through his atoning work, 
His atoning work, Jesus accomplished all these things for you. That's why communion is also called the Eucharist, the Thanksgiving, because we have so much to be thankful for as we approach the Lord's table today. Thank you so much. Woo! Yeah. You, you, you really don't get a five-minute sermonette more packed with glory than that. That's such a good, good preparation for this table. And I want to invite our team to come and serve us. Please just remain seated. They're going to pass the elements, and then in a few minutes, we're going to take, we're going to take this together. And as they are uh, serving you, the team is going to lead us in a little bit of worship. You can follow along with them. But let's just be preparing our hearts for what the Lord has for us this morning at this table. take the bread and cup. Anne saw something in the first service. I want her to come and just release over us as we uh, get ready to take the communion. Um, in the first service when we were taking communion, the Lord just gave me a picture. And when we took the bread, I saw a picture of the Lord. And right before he went to the cross, he was being whipped. And every time he was whipped it was a label a negative label on him and he took the label from us and it went on him and then when we took the cup when we drank it i saw that every time his blood dropped 
every time there was a blood drop it went on a piece of paper where there was a negative label and the moment the blood hit that piece of paper that label disappeared and so I just believe the Lord is saying that every time you have that negative label just know that in his blood those labels he has taken them on himself and we don't have to carry them anymore and every time the enemy whispers it just know that he has taken it upon himself wow thank you lord let's take the bread let's pray over this lord we thank you for your body broken for us This matzah bread, striped and pierced, reminding us by your stripes we were healed, that you were wounded for our transgressions, and that every lash of that whip was you taking something off of us and onto you. And we, as your sons and daughters, are forever grateful. We love you, Jesus. Jesus said, take this bread and eat it as often as you do in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. The beautiful thing is Jesus took, um, he changed the Seder, he changed the Passover in the sense that he fulfilled it. And it was at a Passover meal that he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. And if you remember, the blood was put on the doorposts and the lintel. If you know anything about construction, the doorposts and the lintel blood, it would be pierced hands and a crown of thorns and uh, when the death angel came that night if he saw the blood looked down saw the blood everything was fine life remained in that house no blood no life the firstborn died all over Egypt and when Jesus said this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood he was saying from now on when God looks down from heaven he'll see the blood so you're safe he said, this is a cup of the new covenant in my blood. Every time you take it, remember me. Jesus. Let's stand together and sing this next part of this song. When there was sin, your love rushed in. Where sin runs deep, your grace runs deeper for all enslaved. The ransom paid, light of the world, yours is the power. Where there was sin, your love rushed in. Where sin runs deep, your grace runs deep. Dr. Searle for bringing an awesome
word today. It's like a one-two punch. So good. So many good things in there. I just want to, like, that, those last 12 points, it's like, what I need to flip over that tape. <laughs> We've been listening to, nobody knows what a tape is under 20, but we used to have these things called tapes. And um, when it got over, you had to flip it over. And uh, that's what we need to be listening to. The promises of God. Amen. So good. So if you're a guest with us, again, for the first time, you could just go ahead and drop your connection card in the offering basket. It's going to come around in a moment. Also, make sure you grab one of our New Life gift bags on your way out. Uh, you don't want to miss that. Tonight at 6 p.m., we just, we're just getting started this morning, just in case you didn't know. <laughs> we're going to be back tonight at 6 p.m. for a night of worship and healing. Amen? So if... I just feel like, again, we're just getting started, so come on back at 6 p.m. It's going to be an awesome time, and if you need healing, come on out. If you know somebody who needs healing, bring them tonight. God's going to be moving. We have our ministry team. They're, we're going to be praying for words of knowledge for healing. We're going to pray for everybody who needs prayer. It's going to be an awesome time. Uh, this is also a life group week, so our life groups are meeting throughout the community. Um, if you're interested in life groups, you can uh, go to our website. You can talk to me after the service. I'd love to get you connected with our life groups. Next Sunday is a very important thing called Spring Forward, where we have to adjust our clocks so that we're not late to church. Amen? So we're going to remind you today, and we're going to keep reminding you. So, um, But no, no, we want you to be on time for what God is doing. Amen? Um, also, we get the awesome privilege of a, to host a Good Friday service with over five other churches in Marin County. It's happening right here. So this place is going to be packed. It's going to be wall to wall with other believers in Marin that are celebrating what God did. So we're so excited for that. It's, it's, it's happening on the 25th. More information to come. Also, Easter is just around the corner. So again, we're not having just one service. We're not having just two services. We're having three services, amen? It's gonna be so awesome. We're, we're literally making room for the harvest that God is bringing. And this is gonna be an all hands on deck Sunday <laughs> with all these services. So if you're part of our, our different ministry teams, we, we need everybody to step up. Um, also coming up on Saturday the 19th, uh, the men are having their steak and eggs breakfast. So it's going to be a good time. Sign up today. See Dave McReynolds out the floor. It's $8. Uh, if you sign up ahead of time, we're $10 at the door. Also happening on the 20th, Sunday, the 20th. Um, just, just turn to your neighbor and say, Taco Sunday. <laughs> Taco Sunday. Come hungry, leave happy. All right. So just plan on having lunch right here at church. You don't want to miss the, the tacos and the food that's going to be there. All the proceeds go to help sponsor uh, kids to get to Easter camp that don't have the funds. So, again, it's a great meal. It's a great cause. It's a great time of fellowship. Um, there's going to be combinations. It's going to be a great deal. So, um, without further ado, we're just going to have our ushers come as we, we all give our tithes and offering to the Lord today. We're just going to pray into this. We're going to rejoice as we give today. Can we do that? Are you grateful in Jesus? That we are so grateful. Lord Jesus, Lord, as we give of our tithes and offerings today, Lord, but we know that as we give it here, Lord, you truly receive it in heaven. Lord, we give with thankful hearts. Lord, thanking you for the work of the cross. Lord, thanking you for our new identity. Lord Jesus, so Lord, so Lord, I just pray that you would just pour out a blessing, Lord, upon your people, Lord, as we give today. And all God's people would say, amen. Let's give church.
you now.